So, uh, thanks, thanks everyone for uh, for coming along, and uh, welcome to the session titled uh, "Manage, Secure, and Socialize Kafka Topics with the IBM Cloud Pack for Integration." And my name is Peter Jessup. I'm a brand uh, technical specialist, integration specialist with IBM. And what I'm going to be speaking about today is a new set of capability capabilities within IBM's Cloud Pack for Integration. And we're calling this event endpoint management. And the way you can think of this uh, is extending all the principles of API management, but into a, an asynchronous API domain, including events and messages. So today we're going to talk about this new and emerging space. Uh, it's been driven by you know, resurgence of uh, event-driven architectures. And we'll look at how we see this fitting alongside APIs uh, and why it's important and how it fits into an overall integration solution. And then we'll you know, talk, also talk about what it uh, actually means to, to manage event endpoints and what uh, technologies and techniques it takes uh, to make all this possible. And then finally, I'll give a short demonstration of this product feature working for you so uh, you can see it in action. So let's start with the question, uh, you know, and it's a fair one, why events alongside APIs? And why do we think uh, events are important to think about in this way as part of your integration solution? So let's use this picture uh, to find out what gaps we see events filling as part of a fully coherent integration strategy. So to start, let's talk about how two applications may want to interact. Now, the first way is by requesting an action. Uh, so in, in uh, the, the top of the, uh, the diagram there, uh, something such as place an order or you know, transfer some money. So these are examples of something you want another application to do. And you have the application update one or more backend systems to fulfill that request. So these interactions, as you're probably already aware, are a most natural fit to an API interaction, where the calling application, so application one in the diagram, makes a call over REST. Doesn't have to be REST, but uh, that's typical. And that API then uh, invokes a known interface for application two to complete the request. And generally then to send back an acknowledgement uh, to that, requ that, re that request has been processed. So in the diagram there, the, uh, the ACK um, on the top of the screen. So uh, that's that's sort of scenario number one. So let's move on to you know the, the request state pattern now uh, further down. Well here we are requesting some data from a remote system such as you know tell me the account balance or you know where is my order or what is the address of this specific customer. So this is an interaction where we are requesting something from a remote system and we are expecting a response back. And this is a very, another very common pattern, and uh, it's very well matched for uh, asynchronous API again. So where those remote systems uh, surface, you know, the data of interest in this case to the calling application. So this again is synchronous action, a lookup of a, a backend data store, and then uh, that, data, that uh, API really returns the account balance or customer details as, uh, as we've requested to uh, application one. So, so far so good. But here's where you know things are, are going to get a bit interesting now as we've talked about two interaction patterns where we have been using uh, synchronous APIs, but there is another way we can find out state from a remote system. And that is with an event pattern. And these are gaining popularity in ever increasing waves, um, particularly in situations either where you know, we need to access the data with very low latency or where we want to access that data you know, much more frequently. Uh, and that's particularly in the case where uh, you know, a backend system is not designed to be able to service a request in that model. Uh, and there are plenty of those out there. So you know, we, may always, we also may want to make you know, complex queries on the, and that data in, uh, in various ways. So the event-driven way of getting you know, state back from a backend is now where we turn the situation on, it, on its head somewhat. And, and so that backend data store, rather than servicing an API, and you know, every time the data changes, it actually publishes a changed data event to a topic. And so that any application uh, which subscribes to that topic can access it. And then, uh, you know, perhaps rebuild that portion of the data they're interested in, uh, maybe in a local data store, as we see on the, on the diagram there on the third, uh, third app down. Um, and so every time application one wants to, to look up some data, 
you can use that kind of read-only cache data store instead of making a remote invocation. And that obviously improves, uh, you know, lookup times and reduces reliance on, on remote network calls. So that's all goodness. Now, this type of interaction pattern is absolutely a little bit more complex to set up. But if you're building data hungry or you know, data latency sensitive microservices, for example, this can justify the slightly additional effort. And this pattern is sometimes referred to as an event projection or an event source pattern. And so we're seeing this used a lot more and not just within applications, but also uh, being used to sort of disseminate data across applications. So this is one situation where we're seeing this event-driven interaction pattern, and it's becoming uh, more important from a, uh, from a software development approach uh, as part of an overall integration strategy for, uh, for an organization. So let's look uh, at the Feynman interaction pattern uh, down the bottom there, which talks about notifications. So essentially telling you when something has happened. So, you know, tell me when a new order is placed or when a new customer is created. As you know, you may want to perform some action based on that event taking place, such as enrolling the new customer in a marketing campaign, as an example. And that type of notification pattern is probably uh, the cornerstone for, for you know, automating an organization. And notification, notifications are, by their, their very nature, event-driven. And so you know, there is a sort of a drive towards using notifications in our business processes and building applications or microservices, which can react to what is happening in our organization. And so events, uh, therefore, uh, are becoming you know, more central into to many application designs. So, you know, while we've, you know, we've seen that, you know, APIs uh, are very useful for the kinds of integrations we've been looking to do in the past, you know, now the kinds of applications that we're, we're looking to build or we are building uh, can be, you know, pretty data heavy and, and very latency sensitive. And so, you know, these event patterns are, are more and more important, we believe, to, to application designers. And just before we, uh, we leave this, uh, one more point to note on the diagram is that and you might notice we placed the topics at the boundary of the application in the same place as we placed uh, the API boundaries up the top. And that was deliberate. So, so we should be thinking about these topics as just another way for one application to interact with another. And that pretty much in the same way as, you know, thinking about managing these interfaces in the same way as we manage APIs. And so to reinforce uh, that particular point as to how we see this uh, as being important, you know, we are focusing here on the application boundary. And so if we think about uh, microservice applications, uh, shown in the diagram there, uh, that we're building and interactions between those microservices, which may, you know, may be synchronous, they may be asynchronous, but we don't want to place a heavy, heavy weight management layer within the application itself. As these services that we're building are all kind of within the application and so they belong to us. And so, you know, we may look for some freedom in the interactions within the application and then, you know, keep the approach of those interactions kind of flexible and, and lightweight. However, where we do look to define a little bit more, you know, formality or rigor is around the way we define interfaces and that is at the application boundary. Because this is how other people, be they, you know, application teams or other systems, are going to interact with us. So for a long time now, we've been managing APIs at the boundary of an application, and now we are starting to see events being given sort of equal provenance, if you like, and coming up alongside APIs as more or less first-class citizens. And that's for both you know, existing applications, uh, they're perhaps siloed in some way, and for new applications being developed you know, using new approaches, such as microservice uh, architectures. So I hope we've kind of made a case here for, for those listening as to, to why event-driven interfaces are more popular and to where in an architecture uh, we might need to apply more rigor to managing those interfaces. So now let's just see what this means for what we're doing at the application boundary and what technologies we might be bringing uh, to the table to, to achieve it. So if we break this down into four main areas, uh, for whatever event transport we're using. And, and just to be clear there, uh, you know, being agnostic about the event transport is, is kind of deliberate. 
as there are a plethora of, of different qualities of services and, and the needs for, for event-based applications, you know, far, far more than, uh, you know, back in the synchronous domain. And so we'll talk about how we describe events, make them discoverable, how we, you know, decentralise this or, or sort of make them accessible in a, in a self-service way, um, particularly so we're not relying on a, on a central team, um, which, which, as you probably know, can sometimes become a bit of a bottleneck for consumption of events. And then finally, how we decouple where the events are coming from as to how they're going to be used. So let's look at uh, that first point. So starting you know, with how we are describing events. Now, if you're familiar with API management, as I'm sure you are, then you'll almost certainly be familiar with Open API, which is, is kind of a way of knowing and describing, you know, things like the structure of an API, uh, and you know, in more informally, how to use it, how to you know, contact the owners of it, for example. Uh, we do things like version the API, and uh, absolutely as importantly, you know, how we actually uh, consume it or, or invoke it. And so we describe that in a way in which it fits in with the whole ecosystem. And that's kind of standardized across different tooling, and that kind of helps you, you know, work across teams uh, with, with those particular APIs. So the equivalent to that in an asynchronous world is async API. So it's a sister project to open API, if you, if you like. Uh, it takes more or less the same remit on how to describe these asynchronous interfaces. And you know, from machine um, specific descriptions, such as schemas, for example, uh, all the way up to the human readable descriptions uh, of you know, how to use the event, uh, as, I, as I mentioned before, who owns it. Uh, and that applies to, to, to these event interfaces as well. Uh, it is actually a separate project as opposed to just an extension of, of OpenAPI. And that's probably and more simply because it has you know, more complexities in it. And it does represent you know, everything from you know, lightweight protocols such as uh, MQTT and, and things like WebSockets, uh, all the way up to, to something like Kafka uh, or the MQ protocol, for example, which IBM has already contributed uh, to this particular spec. So this well, this forms the foundation of how we describe these interfaces and, and also allows that broader ecosystem uh, to work with the interfaces. And that includes, you know, things like building out tooling and, and use cases and to reuse that specification across, across different teams. So if you haven't looked at it yet, it's well worth uh, taking a look at uh, that particular project. And now let's look at how, you know, we make events discoverable. And, you know, we're talking to our customers. Uh, we're, we're frequently told that, uh, you know, it's, you know, that the, the, the challenges aren't about connecting to events. You know, as in most cases, that's uh, more or less a, a trivial technical discussion. It's about actually, you know, discovering and finding the events that exist in the first place in, in your organisation. So having a, a central place for people to go and discover the events is probably the, the largest, you know, single hurdle to overcome uh, in this journey. And in this uh, project, we see events as, as another first class says, set of interfaces, the same, pretty much the same as APIs. So we don't see the need to have a separate portal for events or even for different kinds of events. Why not just have, you know, the one single portal, which makes all the different kinds of interfaces available, you know, and that's you know, whether they're REST or GraphQL or SOAP or, or events in this case. So, you know, having an idea of, having a single searchable portal, uh, we believe pretty important. And, you know, it's kind of key, if you like, to bringing that commonality that uh, hopefully uh, this, this talk is sort of building that theme uh, to all the different forms of, of integration styles. So now moving uh, beyond that describing and discovery phase as to how we actually enable people to make use of the events and, you know, what what we really mean by decentralized access. We're all used to, to you know, accessing APIs from a portal. So, you know, we log in, uh, we find one that, uh, that we like to use, uh, and that sort of gives us the opportunity to generate an you know, API key, for example, and then, you know, start using it within our own application. So that self-service idea is probably exactly the same process we want to bring to the async API or asynchronous API. So you should be able to search and find the event you want to start using and generate some credentials and then start using it right away. But with that, of course, 
uh, that power of being able to start using it yourself. Uh, you probably already realise that that brings along the need to put in you know, what, uh, what we might term as guardrails uh, in the form of you know, policies, for example, that govern you know, who can access it, along with tracking it and monitoring uh, the consumption of these events uh, that are being exposed uh, for consumption. So you know, via uh, analytics capabilities, for example, already um, uh, present in a, in a lot of uh, API management solutions. And so we know uh, from that, you know, who's using it and, you know, what uh, at any point in time and then across, across a span of time we can, uh, we can monitor that usage. So these, uh, these guardrails are kind of important, uh, we believe, from an enterprise context uh, to make use of. And then the final area uh, to talk about here is uh, decoupling. And the reason for this, and it's part of the way we want to have uh, kind of consumers using these events, is to ensure that they don't have to worry about where you know, the events are actually coming from. And to make sure, uh, more importantly probably, is that you know, there's nothing a consumer can do to inadvertently affect the backend systems where those events are coming from. So you know, not only wanting to offer those forms of decoupling and protection, but also thinking ahead about you know, other, other things like offering protocol translation and things like interface versioning, so that you know, the consumers using the events don't have to concern themselves directly with that source of the event. And so a lot of what we've described here uh, you know, would be very familiar to people who already do API management, right? But in an event or asynchronous context, this is actually very, very new. So you know, we are embarking upon a, a bit of a journey. So let's talk about that journey for a minute. The, the kind of journey is, you know, what uh, we're trying to, to sort of highlight here is, is the order in which people are starting to think about how to approach events within their, their integration architecture. And if we look, uh, you know, at step one on the, on the slide there, uh, basically, you know, to, to, to catalogue what is available today. So, you know, search through your organisation uh, as far as events are concerned and then add them to a catalogue to make them discoverable to consumers. And then the next step, of course, is then to shorten, uh, you know, the time it takes for people to make use of those events they've discovered and, and allow them to, to generate credentials uh, and use them in an application that they're building or, or event enabling. And then moving on from that is to, to think about new applications and, and how we can expose those application events in exactly the same way to event consumers. And then finally, you know, as a kind of an, an inevitable extension of this, uh, step four, as, as we expose some events to external parties or business partners, third party consumers, and, and to sort of drive and fuel uh, you know, the innovation in an ecosystem, ecosystem of, of developers. So, and we're seeing some SaaS service providers you know, already starting to expose uh, interfaces of events and, and sharing interfaces in this way through things like webhooks and other external facing protocols. But we believe the asynchronous API will see a lot more innovation uh, come as more you know, native style async protocols start to be leveraged in exactly the way that uh, we've described. So, that's enough of, of me, uh, me talking about um, event uh, uh, event driven uh, architectures and um, uh, the the ways in which we might think about uh, exposing them and managing them in in the same way that we do APIs. I'd like to offer up a, a, a short demonstration now um, of self service for developers uh, through an API portal of asynchronous uh, events. So. You know, we hope you've, you've started you know, thinking you about how you might want to begin socialising uh, these events in your own organisation. Um, we're going to see this uh, demonstration of this capability provided in, in the IBM Cloud Pack for integration. So just to walk you through uh, what we're going to be looking at, uh, the first step of the demonstration will be an API developer uh, interacting with the API manager. And that will be to expose a Kafka event source as an API. So in this scenario, we'll define an async API against uh, that Kafka cluster that you see in the diagram there. 
As part of that, the API developer uh, will also publish uh, the asynchronous API and make it visible in the developer portal and also make it available to the events gateway uh, as shown in, in, this, uh, in this diagram here. And then we're going we're gonna to change hats. So uh, we'll see a role change uh, to an application developer as opposed to an API developer. And, and that application developer will use the developer portal, uh, part of uh, IBM's API Connect, API management solution, uh, to discover uh, asynchronous APIs. And uh, the application developer will then create an application object uh, in that uh, developer portal uh, in order to obtain a subscription and credentials uh, to invoke uh, the async API itself. So let me uh, move on to that demonstration for you. So here we are in uh, the API manager of uh, IBM API Connect, uh, the landing page. And what we're going to, to look at today uh, in this particular scenario as an API developer is we're going to develop uh, APIs and products. So we're going to click on the develop API tile. And this will take us into the API development context. And then we're going to add uh, an asynchronous API for a Kafka event. So what we're doing here is filling in the async API specification effectively, but using a form to do that. So we're going to give the async API a, a, a title, we'll call it uh, chatbot customer. So we're going to catch the chatbot events. So when a chatbot on our website asks for customer details, your name and your, your, uh, your contact details, uh, that uh, chatbot's going to fire an event off, which we're going to subscribe to. I'm going to put in my summary here, uh, the customer contact details, uh, which is a bit more of a a verbose description, and then we have the option uh, down below of putting in a lot more detail. For the purposes of the demonstration, we're just going to copy in that description again into that particular form. Now, here's where we're going to actually define the connection uh, to our Kafka cluster. Uh, and uh, the first thing we're going to do is put in the, uh, the bootstrap server information. Now, I'm uh, connecting to uh, another um, capability of the IBM integration uh, cloud pack or, or cloud pack for integration rather uh, called IBM event streams it's a, a fully uh, fully supported Kafka implementation provided in the, uh, the cloud pack uh, we're using this out of convenience it's not necessarily what you need to do you can you know, use any Kafka here of course but uh, for convenience sake we're going to uh, to use IBM event streams so the first thing I want to do is get some connection details uh, how to connect to that cluster so I have my Kafka listener uh, uh, details in front of me. Now I'm going to choose an internal listener uh, because we're running in a, in a um, Kubernetes cluster and we're, we're uh, both the API manager and gateway and the uh, Kafka implementation are both running in the same cluster. So we put our bootstrap server details in. Uh, the next thing I'm going to do is uh, specify the topic that uh, I want to connect to on that Kafka cluster. Uh, we're going to use one called RBT1 uh, in this particular example. So I'll pop that in the topic name. Now the next thing we're going to do uh, is to provide a schema. So uh, for consumers of the, uh, uh, the topic and, and the messages on that topic, uh, we'll provide a, uh, an Avro schema definition, so um, one to, to uh, provide uh, capabilities for uh, serialization of, of, and deserialization of messages, but also uh, just to uh, provide to the, the, API, uh, the API consumer uh, some details around the actual schema of that message itself, so providing a bit of documentation. And then the connection security for this uh, purposes of this demonstration, we're just going to use a uh, plain text security protocol. And the last thing we're asked is, do we want to secure the API using API key in secret? We'll say yes to that. So leave that box checked and we'll click on the, uh, the next button to generate the API. So that's step one, pretty much completed. Uh, so my API has been created now. Uh, so what I'm going to do next is to uh, wrap that API in, in what we call a product. So products are just ways of 
of, of socializing the API and grouping APIs together uh, for consumption in uh, in the developer portal. Uh, I've got a pre uh, pre made uh, product here called Chatbot Events. So I'm just going to select that and we'll pull that product up. And what we're going to do here effectively is just add uh, an API that we've just created. Uh, so that API called, um, and we'll find that in the list here, called Chatbot Customer Details that we've just uh, uh, created. And we're going to add that API to the product. OK, so we're just about ready to, uh, to publish now. So uh, the next, very next step then is to uh, absolutely, actually just publish that, uh, that API in that product. Uh, so to the actual uh, developer portal. And in doing that, we're also going to make uh, that available uh, on the API gateway. So we go through our uh, published product. Uh, we publish to uh, uh, cat uh, catalogs, which are effectively containers for um, different uh, uh, API groupings or, or uh, consumer groupings. Uh, they're logical, logical uh, containers, and we map uh, a catalog directly to um, a, uh, a um, uh, sorry to a uh, uh, set of, of, of gateways. Right. So let's go down now. So here's where we, we kind of talked about guardrails earlier, and 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 here's here's kind of you know some of the things that we can do to kind of you know, protect the API uh, from in terms of visibility and subscribability. So we're going to choose uh, public today just to. Uh, for, for, for convenience sake, but we can customize uh, the visibility of, of the products on the, on the API portal. Uh, we can also uh, make that subscribability self-service or we can uh, push that through a process of, of, of governance and, uh, and, and you know, uh, provide a, a mechanism by which we, we approve or disapprove the, um, the subscription to these APIs. So some things we can do here. Uh, to protect ourselves from from that uh, uh, consumers, um, but we're going to leave those as default here today, and then simply publish that API now. So the visibility of the product uh, has been updated, and uh, now the product has been actually published uh, to the uh, to the uh, developer portal. So here's uh, the point in the, the demo where we're going to um, just swap hats now. So so far, we've seen the API developer um, put together the, uh, the API definition for that asynchronous event, that chat, chatbot customer details API. And now we're actually going to, to, to put the, the hat on of an application developer who's going to go into the development portal and actually consume that, uh, that API. So let's change to our developer portal. Now, I've already logged in here. I'm just going to refresh that page and we should see there's a chatbot events product uh, appearing in our developer portal so let me just uh, click on that and let's have a look uh, at that particular uh, event uh, here's where i can see my uh so my uh, my apis within the product so i can click on that api in the developer portal now so um, going through my discovery phase and I can see an overview, the details we've typed in, some protocol details, some endpoint details, and then I can drill down into the actual subscription operation. So we can see how to consume uh, that. Uh, we're going to come back to that in a moment. And some properties, which we'll grab uh, as well. We can further explore the, uh, the schema, uh, which we imported into the API definition. And we can say, yep, yeah, no, that's exactly what I'm looking for. Uh, so what we're probably ready to do now is actually um, get some access to the to the actual API. So things that we need, uh, which are shown in the properties here, one is a client ID, which provides us with um, a mechanism to steer us to the correct API. The bootstrap server now, this normally, if you're connecting to a Kafka cluster, would be the Kafka cluster itself. Now we're actually connecting to uh, the gateway uh, bootstrap server address uh, because we're consuming this through the actual uh, API management layer and not directly, of course. So we've captured those details. Uh, the next thing we probably want to do is just uh, to actually get access now to the to the API. So 
this is a subscription process. Um, we're going to select a default plan and the next thing we're going to do is create an application object which allows us to then uh, subscribe uh, to this particular API. So this is our uh, chatbot app and I'll give it a, a brief description uh, to subscribe to uh, the, uh, the chatbot events and then we'll save that application away. That gives us a mechanism now by which we can subscribe using that, uh, that application object. Now, very importantly here are the credentials, right? So remembering that you know, we're now not using necessarily the credentials to connect to the Kafka uh, back end, we're actually using you know, the credentials supplied by the API management layer uh, in order to connect to uh, that particular event. So I'm gonna copy my API key uh, and my uh, API secret and save those away because uh, I'll be using these in, in the application that is actually going to consume these events. So I'll pop those into a little notepad area uh, to safekeeping and then uh, we'll finish the subscription process. So I just click on that uh, chatbot application and confirm my subscription. And we're pretty much done. So just to, to recap what we've done there, we've uh, created uh, an application object, uh, created a subscription uh, to that uh, asynchronous API that we created uh, earlier on in the demonstration. And uh, we've now uh, subscribed with credentials that have been supplied for us to consume the application uh, to that particular product and, and API. So let's just now finally, uh, what we want to do, of course, is to actually consume the API as our next step. So I'm going to use uh, the Kafka uh, uh, node API. Uh, and, and nicely here, we're, we're showing, well, here's a bit of sample code that uh, is going to help you actually connect to that uh, particular um, particular uh, uh, topic within that, uh, that managed async API. So I've, what I've done is I've actually copied that uh, pre-copied that into my text editor, which I'm going to, to use on my console here. So let's just open up that, uh, that piece of code. And so the four, four changes we need to make here, one is, is the first one is the client ID, which uh, we've already been presented with and we've saved away. So we'll just copy that into our, our application code and uh, paste that in. And then uh, the next thing, uh, we're actually going to replace that broker uh, sample with uh, the one that we've copied uh, out of the notepad. No, sorry, out of the uh, portal and popped into our notepad area. And then uh, finally, the two pieces uh, left in terms of um, connecting out the, the username and password. Now, in our code, uh, we're going to provide these uh, in, in the same you're using the same mechanism we would to actually connect to a Kafka broker, but these will be the actual uh, client ID and 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 secret. Um, sorry, the, uh, the the API key and secret that we were provided with from the portal, and the gateway will manage the uh, the, the authorization and, and authentication into the actual Kafka broker itself. And then the fa final thing, we don't have any uh, message keys uh, being provided in this. Uh, in this topic, so we'll just uh, remove that from the uh, the console messages that uh, that we'll get when we actually run uh, run the client. So the final thing now is just to uh, execute the Kafka consumer, and we'll wait for that uh, connection. There's uh, some confirmation that the consumer group is uh, is starting uh, against uh, the Kafka implementation. Now while we're going to take advantage of the fact that you know we've, we've got both hats on here, the API developer, uh, as well as uh, what we're doing here now as, as an application developer and consuming that API. And we can just flick back, uh, do a little sneaky flick back to our uh, Kafka um, implementation and event streams and look at our consumer groups. Uh, we can see here we've got a, a few uh, consumer groups there. And if we look at the, the centre one, we can see that uh, that is us actually connecting now through the, the async uh, API uh, managed 
entry point of the gateway and back into the actual event streams at Kafka cluster. And you'll see we're using a combination there of uh, our uh, client ID and API key as uh, the consumer group ID. So we get a nice unique ID for that, uh, that particular consumer group. So we're happy that uh, we're connected. Now the final thing here is just to uh, send a couple of chatbot messages across uh, and we'll see those uh, as sort of the, the, the final uh, confirmation of the, the test and there they are. So um, that, that uh, you know, as an application developer, now I'm kind of happy that, okay, I've got my, uh, my subscriptions obviously working, my uh, tested my code and I can actually see events coming through. So you know, I can go on, go on uh, have, a, have a cup of coffee and put my feet up for five minutes. So just um, as a, a kind of a recap now, uh, on what we actually saw in, in the demonstration today. So first of all, we, lo uh, we logged into the API manager, uh, part of the, uh, the Cloud Pack Integration API uh, management capability. We created an API, uh, async API. We added that async API to a product and published it onto the gateway. Then we uh, went into the developer portal uh, found or explored our products, found our product, found the API within that product we were looking for, and uh, discovered the uh, you know the suitability for it, uh, and then uh, subscribed to it and and actually consumed that uh, that API. So that kind of concludes um, the formality. Uh, formal section of the, of the presentation and, and demonstration. Are there any uh, questions? Uh, happy to uh, to have a discussion around anything that uh, that you know uh, raised your awareness or, uh, or or raised a question for you. And I'll be here. Uh, for another 15 or so minutes as well to uh, to take those questions uh, should they come up. Hey, Peter, um, no questions have come in so far. So once again, if you would like to ask a question, please go ahead and put it in the chat and we'll be more than happy to answer it.